Welcome to Sounds Like Portraits. I'm Philip Unga. This is a conversation with creative humans. Please visit soundslikeportraits.com and if you like this show, don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher or Google Podcast. And remember to leave us your comment and rating. It really helps new listeners find us. Thank you. My guest this week is Jackie Ferrara. Jackie is a sculptor and draftswoman whose work is exhibited worldwide in the most prestigious collections, including MoMA, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Phillips Collection of the Louisiana Museum of Modern Art in Denmark. Sometimes, Jackie is so focused at her work that she forgets to eat. Is she consciously looking to lose herself? She doesn't know. But that's what happens. It's time to listen to her about her creative process. But before, she tried to tell me what she's always tried to do in her life. I don't think I've, there's anything in all my life that I've tried to do. You know, I started making art late. I'm an alien, and you're going to have problems with me, really. I don't seem to react about things the way everybody else does. I don't think there's anything I've been focused on. I came here in my early 20s. And I thought I wanted to go to nightclubs. You know, it wasn't that I wanted to make art. I just wanted to get out of Detroit. Detroit wasn't hip enough for me, I thought. Jackie, tell me, when did you put artist on your passport? I put artist on my passport with great trepidation in 1959. I didn't have a passport before that. The reason I did it I had a boyfriend at the time who had just gotten a grant, and we were going to live in Italy for a year. And even though I was kind of, I don't know, you know, I was making things out of pottery and doing stuff, but I knew if I was told that if my passport said artist, I'd be able to get into museums free. So I put artist in my, on my passport with, you know, feeling that it wasn't true, but I'd be able to get into the museums free, so I did. And I didn't have to prove that I was an artist. I, just, I wrote it down. So, yes, that was when I first did it. And I don't think I really considered myself an artist until I moved here on Prince Street, which um, was 1971. And by that time, I was 41. What was the turning point? I was living in a loft, much smaller, on the Lower East Side, and I really wanted a place that was a little bigger. What I really wanted was something with higher ceiling, because at the time what I was making, although I wasn't exhibiting, were things that were hanging, and where I had been living, the ceilings were, they were just like nine feet high, which was really low. So I, I was highly motivated. I had an aunt who had a little bit of money and who kept wanting to buy me presents. Whatever she would offer, I was not interested in. And then at some point, I thought, well, maybe I could buy a loft instead of getting a bracelet or whatever it was that she might want to give me. So I started looking for a loft, and then you could buy a loft very reasonably. And so um, I bought this loft. I'm asking about your identity as an artist. And your answer is about a space. That's because once I got here, I felt I was an artist. But when, but what ha- really what happened is I got here, and because I was making, because I was building a place myself, I stopped working for almost a year. I mean, this was a raw space. Nobody had ever lived in it, and there was no kitchen and no bathroom. And, and once I did all that, my work slightly changed and got a little bit more construction-like, more architectural. And it was then that I felt, um, I thought I was an artist. <laughs> so it's like you, you, were, you were following a path and then discovering that you were an artist. Yeah, I was following a path and didn't even know I was on a path. And then I realized, yes, you're right. I was on a path to becoming an artist. And then um, it coincided very soon after my moving here. There was this enormous effort on the part of a number of women artists 
to um, get women in big group shows that were in museums. I didn't know those people. I didn't know about the organizations that were doing it. But, you know, I knew a couple of people, and somehow I got, you know, I got included, and um, it just took off from there. Who were these women artists? Can you give me some names? You mean that, that were active in the group? Oh, I have no idea. I know that a bunch of people, um, they went, they marched by the Whitney, you know, they protested because the Whitney Annual had had one woman, like they have 200 artists and one was a woman and 199 were men. And there was a big protest. I did not know that it was happening, but I did get in the next annual. So now, would you say that your art is culture? Well, it's not. Uh, yeah, I guess it's. I've made a lot of really big things. You know, I've made, I've made an amphitheater. I'm not. A, I'm not an architect, but I've made very big things, sort of like towers or pyramids, obelisks, obelisks. Yeah, there's a bunch of words, <laughs> great words. I like those words. They sound nice to me. But because of, I was making, you know, they were indoor pieces. But what started to happen is I got good reviews. And so I got attention. And what started to happen is some of co some art colleges in the United States, they had programs or projects that they liked to do with an artist outside. And so I made a number of wood pieces that were made out of wood that was hardy enough that went outside. And because of that, it evolved into stone. And once it evolved into stone, it meant, you know, I could make a 70-foot tower. I could, you know, I could do anything. So it was not only a change of scale, it was a change of, of material. Well, yes, it was certainly that. Can you tell me How do you see the connection between this change of scale and this change of material? Well, first I have to say something else, which is that all of the work that I've always done, I figure it out in advance on graph paper. Well, with graph paper, you know, you can say each square is like a quarter of an inch. You could say it's a foot. And with all of the pieces, how they look on the paper... I thought they would look great if they were 100 times that size. The problem with the wood was that it was going to be temporary. It would have, it would last out, even cedar. It really didn't matter what it was. It would last maybe 20 years. It would then start to crumble. A number of those pieces have been rebuilt. And people liked them. It was nice. I was glad. But the thing with stone was... I don't know, it took me somewhere else. And then the other thing with the stone was that often it was a, with the public art commissions, often it was, it was percent for art legislation. So it meant that a college, a university, was building a new building, and they had legislation on campus that a percentage of the cost of the building had to go for art. Well, sometimes what they did with that percentage was, you know, they bought some paintings and they hung them in the building. But sometimes they would ask the architect to work with an artist. And so, like one time it was the architect wanted a fountain in a courtyard, and I got to design the fountain. So often what, what was happening was that I was being commissioned to make something that had a certain kind of function. And I, I, that was fun for me, you know. It was it was like a, a new problem. I mean, I've always I've always felt that what I was doing in my work was problem solving, that I had to figure out my pieces, and I had to figure out how much lumber they needed, and I had to saw them all, and I had to put them in order after I sawed them, then I had to put them together. And so this was, and I'm somebody who always liked doing puzzles anyway, so this was like another problem to solve, and. Um, It was very seductive. What is the starting point for you when you start making a new piece? It used to be, but it's not now. But it used to be that something in the piece I just finished, there was like a curve or an angle or a little part. I thought, ah, I like that. And I would, I would embellish it or make it bigger. or, or make Expand it. it. Yeah. 
And I started doing that really, you know, mostly full time. It paid enormously well. And with that, it almost always was an assigned space. So something had to go in a certain space. And sometimes they would want something that maybe people could sit on. I mean, one time it was an airport floor. Where was it? It's in Pittsburgh. It's the main airport. But, it, you know, the things were, the possibilities were all over the place. But I come back to your to your starting point. Tell me more about about the feeling you get when you when you have this this impulse to to start something new it's it's you see now i'm doing i'm doing a lot of individual drawings and i'm not very good at drawing they don't come that easily to me but like with the drawings that actually is an impulse and i can't tell you how often it's triggered by a, a movie i I see something, I really like going to the movies and always have, and of late, well, starting up, it's not of late, it's about 12 years now, I saw a movie that I thought was shockingly violent, and I saw it at a at an art theater, and walking home, I, I wondered, you know, they have film noir festivals, and they have comedy ones, and they have sci-fi festivals, and I wondered why they didn't have violent film festivals. So I started to make a list. So I've been doing that for about 15 years now. So I have a list of violent movies for a violent film festival. I don't have a theater to show these in, but I have the list. And then I started, with my drawings, I started listing the movies, some of these festivals, as a background. But I was listing them in Morse code. So it just looks like squares and I really don't know what made me think of Morse code. And I had a show at the drawing center, and the show was to do the walls of a, of a corridor. That's And so the drawings I did had Morse code on them. And I, I put all my film festivals on those walls. It was just an installation. It was up for a year and a half. It's not there anymore. And then I got serious about, you know, All my drawings now have Morse code on them, and it's, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy the translating. And from the drawings, you, you start to build the wooden structure. Can we put it like this? Not the drawings I'm doing now, no. See, I, I feel like I do two kinds of drawing. So I have this card file. A lot of it is now on a computer, but it started as a card file, where I had drawings. And those were the drawings that had to do with the sculpture. And then I had something that I called drawing drawings. And that was the other kind of drawings. At that point then, this is a few years ago, I didn't have very many drawing drawings. I would say I made, you know, five a year or something. But now it's pretty much what I do all the time. And it's mostly because um, I can't get any, any public commissions anymore because they think I'm going to die because I'm so old. How old are you, Jackie? I'm going to be 90 on Sunday. And you look so young. I yeah. I come back to your sculpture, to the wooden structure. They look like pyramids, obelisks. Is there any connection with this sacred architecture for you? No. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. One of the very first pieces I made out of wood was I had a, a bunch of two-by-fours left over from construction in my house, you know, renovation of my lot. And I cut them, cut them into lengths, so they were all maybe a foot long. So I had about a 30 of them or something. And I was trying different things. And what I really liked best was I, I made, I just stacked them up, you know, 10 on the bottom, 9, 8, 7, 6, made this little pyramid. I really liked how that looked. And you know, at some point all of these uh all of these pyramid shapes I was making, they got more and more complicated. Complicated in, in that I was doing something with negative space. I was making gaps. And with the gaps I could draw a line or I could make a curve. And I would say that originally I was doing gaps because I was sort of making things like the way you might build a log cabin, two pieces going 
north-south and then two going east-west and then two on top of that north-south. And I wasn't filling in the spaces in between because that would mean I'd have to buy more wood. And at the time, I was very poor. But at some, to at some point, I started filling it in, but I would leave a little space. And I was sort of like drawing on the pyramids. I got a review once that really distressed me <laughs> because the person had had tried to find the pyramids I was copying and had done all this research on Egyptian and I guess you know, South American pyramids and couldn't find any. I was like so upset that she thought that that's what they were because, I mean, I've never seen a real pyramid. I would like to. What guides you when you are at work? It's the pre-building that's all the decision-making. Once I decide, then I, I just cut the wood and build it. I just have to trust my, uh, my judgment <laughs> or my aesthetics. I mean, I, you know, I don't come out of any kind of training about art history. And, and actually, I don't go to museums very often at all. And if I go, I sort of walk by paintings. I mean, I, you know, I, I sometimes feel I have the soul of a plumber or a carpenter rather than, than an artist. You were talking about your aesthetic. How would you describe it? See, the first thing I thought of was that it's very minimal. And a lot of the reason it's very minimal is I actually can't stand chaos. And I don't like a lot of things around. I'm uncomfortable in places where they have like lots of lots of little figurines on shelves and lots of things hanging and lots of pictures on the wall. It all makes me uncomfortable. So that would definitely be a strong point for me is that I like something at its most reduced, if possible. Geometrical. Well, it's always geometrical. I think that I think the, the work is for sure it's geometrical. A lot of the pyramids, the the shapes were are based on increments, a series of increments. There would there would always be some rules that I would invent, like uh, if two boards are rising opposite each other, I have to imagine that this is layers. So there's two boards going north south, and then two boards going east west, and that. That's continued as it goes up. Well, the width of the boards, say the one on the on the right is an inch, and the one on the left is three inches. And the one on the right stays one inch as it goes up, but the one on the left starts to narrow. And the point where I would stop is when it would become one inch, like the other one. So I would make all these like little rules like that. That was really like the motivation. It was um, many years later, and it really started with wall drawings. I got a little interested. Well, no, I did it with sculpture. I got a little interested in color, like adding some color. With the wood, it would be stain. So things, sometimes I would make a sculpture that I would stain part of it with a blackish color and the other part with a reddish color. Unfortunately, All of those pieces have somewhat faded, so I thought I was using a permanent stain, but I wasn't. Is it a problem for you now? I mean, the sustainability of all the of all your works. I'm a little sad. Even some that are here. I mean, I have some in the back that are really, you know, in a dark spot, and they they're quite faded. They don't look anything like the original color. I think that happens a lot with art. You know, it's not stain is not like like paint. And I wouldn't want to, I never wanted to paint the wood. What kind of experience are you looking for for yourself when you are at work? Well, when I'm at work, I'm, I'm so involved. I don't think about it as an, I'm looking for an experience. I'm experiencing. I mean, sometimes I forget to eat because I get so interested. And I'll, I'll suddenly realize it's three hours past my lunchtime. I don't know that I'm consciously looking to lose myself. I really never thought about that at all. But it's what happens. It's just a very satisfying kind of focus. How do you know that a piece you're working on is finished? I know it's finished before I... Uh, I mean, it's only the drawings I wouldn't know when it was finished. But any of the sculpture, I know it's... I may not like it once it's done, but... I have finished it before I started to make it. 
I mean, some of my drawings are eight pages. They're really very, very precise. And I'm quite clear about what's going to happen. I have destroyed some work, you know, not that many, because what I expected to happen didn't happen. So there were expectations. It was a, a look, a look I wanted. Something, something else happened. I mean, there's one in particular where the photograph of it is, is actually nice, but it's, it's misleading. It was one that was kind of a pyramid shape that had a, a bowl shape inside of it. And what I did not anticipate at all is that when you looked at it from the exterior, that the bowl shape on the interior would be that apparent. I didn't want that to happen. And so this secret bowl that was going to be in it, once you walked up to it and looked down in it, was not a secret. I destroyed it. But that was a very rare occurrence. Usually I really knew. knew. What was nice, when some little aspect of it, which wasn't a feature, I got interested in making it a feature, and that triggered the next one. And all the time with the wood ones when I was making them, like as soon as I finished one, there was like the next one that I wanted to start. Start with the graph paper, trying to figure it out. So would you say that there's a thread between your different works? Oh, sure. I think it's very apparent, my work. I think people always know it's mine. I always felt nobody would copy me because it was so much trouble. Too many boards to put together, and like nobody would want to do that. I've actually never seen anything that I thought you know, was any kind of a ripoff at all. I think somewhere I wrote once that, For me, making art is solving problems. Yet, I have always liked solving problems. When I visit an artist studio, usually it's a, a it's like it's 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 a mess. It's like a, a chaos. And here, it's very it's very neat. I, I know, it's very neat. It's not necessarily really clean, but it's very neat. Yeah, it's the whole thing. I it truly, truly makes me uncomfortable. A mess makes me uncomfortable. Did you learn something essential from, from your art about yourself? It's a very interesting question, and I, I'm sure I'll think of something tonight, but, oh, God, I'm not introspective, I think. For me, the, the, you know, how it resonates with me, it's like there's uh, something hidden, like a hidden code, like a hidden geometry in your work. That could be. That could be. Um, I mean, almost always nobody, nobody sees it the way I do. Is it important for you to put words on your creative process like you're doing now with this interview? No. No, <laughs> it's not. It never was. I mean, I've done this very little. I've maybe shown images of my work, but I don't think I ever talked about it very well. I never taught. I don't have discussions about my work. This is the last step of the interview. I'm going to leave the place. Please hold the microphone and add whatever you want to the interview. Well, I actually think, I think, I think you're smart and that you really want to connect. And I suspect that and maybe I'm secretive. Or I just haven't examined certain things about myself. But I think that a lot of what I do, I just do it. Am I avoiding? Possible. I don't, I'm just not used to explaining what I do. I, th I think I'm a, I'm a little bit of a hermit. I don't know if that, if that explains anything. I guess that's, I don't think I'm going to add anything. I wonder if I can just put this down without something bad happening. I do want to thank you because you've made me think and that's good for me. Thank you, Jackie, for sharing your story. It was Sounds Like Portraits, a podcast by Philip Ungar. Visit soundslikeportraits.com and if you like this show, don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher or Google Podcasts. And remember to leave us your comment and rating. It really helps new listeners find us. Thank you. Music Charmeuse de Serpent, composed and conducted by Olivier Glisson. See you soon for the next episode.